Thank you so much. Um, and thank you everybody for joining today. Sustainability is a topic that I've become really passionate about. Um, you know, looking back, I realize it's it's been an interest in my life for more than 25 years now. But recently, it's become clear that psychology really has a role to play in affecting the way people behave around sustainable behaviors. So I'm very excited to start to get more active in this area and hopefully leverage my expertise and experience, which has mostly been in the, the realm of health, to help make the world a greener place. So I want to just start off by talking about motivated people and what, what is motivation, because I think it's really important to understand this anytime we're talking about behavior change. Um, one definition of motivation that I like a lot is that it's desire with velocity. It's this idea of wanting to do something. And without motivation, which is what you see over here on the left-hand side of the scale, a motivation, um, you're not going to get any sort of sustained behavior in a person. There really needs to be some sort of fuel for behavior in order for it to take place repeatedly over a period of time, especially the sorts of deliberate behaviors that make up sustainability. So you think about the sorts of conscious choices that people have to make in order to have sustainable behaviors. So if you think about motivation, there, there are many different types of motivation, and this comes from a theory called self-determination theory of motivation. But you can really think about them as along a continuum. So as I mentioned, all the way on the left there is a motivation or a lack of motivation entirely. And when you find people who are in that situation, chances are they are not ready for behavior change. They, they are very difficult to influence. And so typically with behavior change interventions, we don't focus very much on those people. Then you have your externally motivated people. So a lot of people are familiar with the phrase extrinsic motivation, which comes from some sort of external reward, or sometimes it's a punishment as well. If you think about somebody nagging you to do something, that is an extrinsic motivator. And that can get people to make a behavior change, but that type of behavior change tends to be very vulnerable to obstacles. So um, if you think about health psychology, a lot of people will make changes to their diet after visiting their physician and hearing that they're overweight or they have some sort of other alarming health indicator. And they may be pretty good about their new eating habits until it's really easy not to be. Um, you know, they're out with their friends and there's peer pressure to eat the hamburger or they're alone and nobody knows that they're having a donut. So external motivation can get people to do things, but it typically is very vulnerable. And then the next step on the continuum is what you call introjected. And this is really the same thing as extrinsic motivation, but it's when you start to carry those nagging voices around inside of you. You can tell that somebody is introjected motivated when they say things with a lot of shoulds. I should or, oh, I'm being bad. And again, um, you know, that will get people to make some changes, but it, it continues to be very vulnerable to obstacles. From there, you get into what we call the more autonomous forms of motivation, and these are really the more self-generated and the more durable types of motivation. So identified is when a person has a goal or something that they value, and they see behaviors as being consistent with that. So they may not really value the behavior in and of itself, but they really care about the goal that they see as being a consequence of that behavior. From there you have integrated, and this is now where you start to think of that behavior as part of who you really are. So again, this doesn't necessarily mean that you like or value the behavior per se, but you care a lot about what it means about you to do it or not. And I think if you think about sustainability, actually, you can really see here the potential to help people think about themselves as future thinking individuals who care about the next generation, who value taking care of limited resources that we've been provided, and you know, therefore, when they're making decisions in their daily life, that's something to keep in mind. And then finally, the, the holy grail of motivation is intrinsic motivation, where you choose to do a behavior because it just genuinely feels good. There's pleasure in that behavior itself. Um, I'm of the opinion that you very rarely see this in a lot of the formal behavior change type work that people do around health and financial services and now sustainability. Um, this, this really tends to be more um, pure pleasure type behaviors, but it is, in fact, the most invulnerable type of motivation. So as we think about influencing people and changing their behaviors, the goal is to move them as far along this continuum as possible towards autonomous motivation, because that's where long-term change happens. That's where the motivation is able to weather bumps in the road and overcome obstacles. 
So from here, I'm going to talk about um, a public health example of behavior change that's been quite successful. I'm going to point out along the way the things that happened at an individual and a societal level that helped move people closer to this right-hand side of the motivational continuum. So the public health success story that I'm gonna talk about is still in progress. It's not a battle that's totally won. And in fact, many people, if you just ask them without context would say that this is still a significant societal problem. But in fact, as I'll show you, we've made a real significant amount of progress in the last several decades. So what am I gonna talk about? It's, it's smoking, tobacco smoking, and um, getting people to quit cigarettes. So as I mentioned, especially depending on where in the United States you live and who your social group is, you may still perceive this as something that's a significant problem. And in fact, there are quite a few Americans who are regular tobacco smokers. But in fact, the smoking rate has declined very significantly since the 50s and 60s when it was at its peak. So this is a graph of smoking prevalence in the U.S. over time, and you can see in 1964 is when it was at its highest. It was at about 43% of all American adults smoked cigarettes regularly, um, which is just staggering. I mean, that's, that's, that's nearly half. In 2015, which is the most recent CDC data, you can see that it's down to about 15% of American adults. So over 50-some years, we've seen um, you know two-thirds two of the smoking population drop, and you can see it's been almost linear over time. So that's actually pretty good. So what can sustainability learn from what's happened in terms of smoking cessation and the psychological tactics that were used there? The first is around creating awareness. And I'm kind of excited to get to talk about this because with a lot of health behavior change, this is actually no longer a really effective tactic. And why? Because we've been running the same campaigns for so many years, for decades even, that it's hard to create new awareness. And Act, people hear you know, smoking kills, you know, eating saturated fat is not good for you. I get it. And it almost has a, a reverse effect when people have heard the message so many times. But I think with sustainability, we have an opportunity to create awareness around a topic that people really don't know that much about yet, that we're really still actively learning about as a community. And smoking once was that way as well. So this, um, this is a screenshot of the cover of the Surgeon General's report to the advisory committee about the state of smoking in the United States. And believe it or not, so this is from 1964, and it was the first really well done research document that was able to conclusively say cigarette smoking causes significant health problems. So before that, even though it feels intuitive now, 50 years out, to say, yeah, cigarette smoking is bad for you, they really didn't have the scientific consensus around that. So this was the first time that they were able to do that. And as a result of this report, there started to be more um, education in general in public around the consequences of smoking. And you can see in the graph on the right, the report came out right where the red arrow is, 1964. And if you remember the, uh, the smoking rates that I showed you, that was the height of smoking in the United States. From that time, smoking began to linearly drop in the United States. And a lot of that initially was due to the fact that people were learning for the first time that smoking was truly bad for their health, that it was tied to these really negative long-term consequences. I think we have a similar opportunity with sustainability to start to create that awareness around some of the decisions that people make in their daily lives and the longer-term consequences for them and for people they care about. One of the things that we can do, even when information is kind of old hat, when people do know what's going on, is we can help to frame it in ways that are consistent with their values. So I mentioned before that you can get a backfire effect sometimes if you say to somebody, smoking kills. Um, and I, I think we've probably all seen this with people we know in our own lives who smoke. It doesn't really do a lot of good to remind them of the public health problems with smoking. But what sometimes I've seen work, especially with women or people who are really uh, interested in their appearance, is focusing on some of the appearance-related consequences of smoking. So the fact that your fingers might look yellow from holding a cigarette, or that you'll get a certain wrinkle pattern around your mouth that, as you age, isn't um, the ideal of beauty. So talking about those sorts of things is more consistent with values that those particular individuals have, and it can help them to change their behaviors. When you think about sustainability, one of the things that I've been really interested in watching, especially around politics and sustainability, is that you sometimes see these groups who you would expect 
to support non-sustainable industries or technologies actually moving the other way. And I think what's happening there and where there's a lot of promise, I think, is that they're understanding that more sustain. So for example, if you look at um, truckers, there are contingents in the trucking industry that are very interested in sustainable fuel sources. And I think that those people have started to realize that moving towards more sustainable transportation methods is actually consistent with their long-term values of maintaining a job, maintaining a place in the industry. We're keeping with the status quo of the technology over time. It may be good right now, but 20, 30 years down the road, it may mean that their job is no longer there for them. So by thinking about the issue in terms of things that they value that are personally meaningful, they come around to a different point of view. The second psychology-based tip that we've seen with smoking cessation that I think has a lot of potential for sustainability is adding in social dynamics. So we all live embedded in social contexts at multiple levels, from our personal and family relationships, to our workplaces, to our towns and cities, then to our larger cultures. And at every um, one of those circles, we are affected by the way that others around us behave and the things that are considered to be the social norm. So that, that gives us a lever of influence when we think about sustainability. In terms of smoking, I love this example just because it harkens back to my childhood. This is a, an illustration from Ramona and Her Father by Beverly Cleary. When the main character, Ramona Quimby, is trying to get her dad to quit smoking, she creates all of these signs and posters and hangs them around their house. And her, um, you know, her line breaks are, are perhaps not great, which gives her dad an opportunity to make some jokes about Nosmo King and who is that. But I always think about this and about how at the family level, um, children have actually played a really important role in getting their parents to quit smoking. That's a dynamic you saw a lot through the 70s and 80s as there was education at the elementary and high school level. So kids are hearing about how bad smoking is and they're coming home and watching their parents light up and they're speaking up and saying like, hey, listen, I love you and I don't want you to do this. So that actually um, for a time was a really effective lever of change. And I think there, again, there's an opportunity there as our younger generations are growing up in a world where sustainability is becoming more the norm and they're being exposed to a uh, smarter science around that. You also see this at an adult level. So this is data from a peer reviewed study. It was done with the Truth Foundation. So they have uh, an online smoking cessation program called Become an X. It is aligned with the Mayo Clinic, so it follows a clinically validated protocol for smoking cessation. And it has this online community, so um, you know, essentially message boards, and you're able to connect with others online and share your stories and give advice. And so they, they conducted a study of their own users, and they were able to look at people who either didn't use the community at all, who used it passively. So these are your lurkers. They're going online, they're reading, but they're not posting or responding. And then active users. And what was really interesting when they looked three months out who had successfully quit smoking, people who even just lurked in the community were more than three times as likely to have quit smoking three months out. That feeling of belonging to a bigger group of people who were working on this goal together was really helpful in helping them make this difficult change and sustaining it over three months, which is pretty significant. I mean, people who quit smoking, they, um, they fail time and again. It's one of those changes that takes a lot of attempts to stick. So to see people successful three months out at a 15% rate, that's really quite good. So again, I think there's a lot of promise here in terms of influencing individuals through their social circles and their communities. The next one is substituting means to the end, and that's really because many of the behaviors we do, and this gets back to the motivational continuum I shared as well, they are in service of another goal that we have. So with smoking, there are a lot of reasons that people smoke, um, aside from the physiological addiction, which is a very real thing, but they have other reasons why they have decided to become smokers or why they've decided not to attempt to quit. And one of those that you see quite a bit is that smoking is a, um, it's a social activity. People take their smoke breaks together. You may be going out to you know, the bowling alley or um, the bar, and that's where you and your friends all light up together. So it's part of this larger social context, and it's a way that you bond with your friends. So you think about how habits are made. This is the habit cycle. There's some sort of trigger in the case of the smoking example I just gave. Maybe it's you see your buddy at the bowling alley, and that is your cue that it's time to pull out the cigarettes because that's what everybody's doing. 
you take your action, which is smoking a cigarette, and then you get the reward, which is both the, um, you know, the burst of nicotine that feels good at a physiological level, but also that bonding with your friends. If you can replace anything in this cycle, that gives you the power to start to change the habit. And so um, one of the things that we've seen with smoking, is, and I'll show you a little more about this in the next one, is that by making it harder to take the action of smoking in these common trigger situations, we've really been able to reduce the, the number of people who smoke. And when you give people advice about quitting smoking, a lot of times it's around um, how, how can you create a different situation for yourself. So instead of going to the bowling alley that allows smoking with your buddies, can you guys choose to go to a different location? Can you go see a movie together? Um, could you do something to bond that's different from smoking? Maybe you order the big plate of nachos. So again, you just think about what are people actually getting out of the behavior and is there something else that you can substitute that will help them get that same effect? Um, with sustainability, by the way, I think oftentimes the benefit that people are getting, the reward, is the expediency of it. It's easier to do things that are not environmentally friendly. That's just the default path, and it's much easier for me to take it. So I think here an opportunity really is to make the sustainable choice an easier choice. Next is changing barriers and facilitators. So these are the things that enable people to take a behavior or not. And I previewed this a little bit, but one of the big changes that we've seen in the United States over the last several decades is where people are allowed to smoke. So as of the last time I checked, which was in the last few weeks, 36 states in the United States have completely banned smoking in restaurants and bars. And what you've seen when that happens is that the smoking rate actually drops because as it becomes harder for people to smoke, they're less likely to do it. And additionally, what this um, visible no smoking ban does is it creates that social pressure and that attention to the smoking behavior that wasn't there before. So it's, it's really helping to work on multiple levers. As a counterpoint, um, the Truth Organization that I mentioned before, Truth Initiative, they have identified, they, they're about in the middle of the United States, um, that have the highest smoking rates in the US. So I showed you before that, um, 15% of all Americans smoke. It's much higher than that in these states and then much lower in some of the other states. What you find in these 12 tobacco nation states is that an average smoker is having 26 more packs per year than a smoker elsewhere in the US. And what you see happening, happening at more of a facilitator level is that cigarettes are cheaper there. These are states that have chosen not to tax cigarettes to the same extent that other states have. So the cigarettes are much more affordable, and as a result, you see people smoking them more. So this is where those public health efforts around taxing and policy have really affected the behavior that people, that people take. And again, I think that there are some opportunities here for sustainability as we start to think from a regulatory level. What are we doing to enable um, sustainable behaviors? What are we doing to make those choices more affordable, more convenient? in some cases, um, you know, clearly preferred by, by legislation, those will really affect the um, prevalence of sustainable behaviors. So to sum, the, the four big things that I have for behavior change lessons for a sustainable future, first of all, creating awareness. And again, I think we have a real opportunity in this area where it is still relatively new. Um, people are not tired yet of hearing the same old sustainability messages, and we have a lot of opportunities to experiment with different ways to talk about sustainability so that it's consistent with people's values. Adding social dynamics, and this, this does play with the changing barriers and facilitators, but working at different levels of society, um, you know, influencing people like our young children who are in schools and helping them to understand sustainability and sustainability science from an early age, so that they are joining the sphere of influence and starting to make it much less acceptable to behave in some of the old ways. Substituting means to an end. So starting to understand why people are engaging in non-sustainable behaviors and making it easy for them to make different choices. Changing barriers and facilitators, this is now thinking more at a societal level. How can we make it easier for people to do, do the right thing for the environment? And then again, I just want to underscore because we think back to that motivational spectrum. It is important to respect individual autonomy. And I know that one of the big criticisms of some of the more um, regulatory pressure on sustainable behaviors, and you hear it with cigarettes, you hear it with things like soda taxes, is that it doesn't respect individual autonomy. 
I think there's room for argument there. Um, you know, it certainly does make certain choices more difficult for people. If you're asking somebody to pay more money to, um, you know, put something in the trash as opposed to put something in the recycling, sure, that's a little, that is putting your thumb on the scale of free choice. But I think that there are ways that you can still do that within a larger structure of respecting individual choice and values to help people feel like this is something they're opting into as opposed to being forced to do. So I think a lot of it here is going to be in the style. It's going to be the art combined with the science. I'm really excited to see what we can all do together to make it happen. So thank you all very much. And I'm really looking forward to the